Great. Great. Well, I'd like to thank the Cotton Board for setting this up and for everybody uh, taking time out of your day to, to learn a little bit more about sustainability and how Cotton Incorporated is helping to move the needle on cotton sustainability. Uh, I hear a lot of times when I speak to, to most of you that, hey, I'm a generational farmer. My, you know, my grandparents and you know, many generations of farming have occurred on that land. And you know, by the essence of that, it is sustainable in many ways. And in reality, you know, it certainly is. And I also hear that you know, there's oftentimes the perception of sustainability having moving goalposts. And you know, frankly, that's something to that, that, that is to some extent accurate. But you know, it's in a lot of ways not very different than other production challenges you may have, such as herbicide, resist, herbicide resistance with weeds. You know, those goalposts, they're definitely changing, unfortunately. So you overcome these types of challenges all the time. And it's just kind of nature of production and in this situation, sustainability. As the world's needs change, you know, have more people in certain areas or we're growing more product or, or um, crop in these areas, you know, it's a dynamic system. Things change. The needs for sustainability change. And within the cotton industry, the needs to communicate that have really changed. And we're doing a much better job of telling your story and making plans to improve sustainability through time. So we're going to get into uh, what we're doing at Cotton Incorporated and throughout the industry to help improve cotton sustainability reputation and make meaningful, measurable change on the farm. So I mentioned improving cotton's reputation, sustainability reputation, that is core to what the sustainability division does at Cotton Incorporated. We do that through five major areas of work, um, improving on-farm sustainability, working with the US Cotton Trust Protocol and helping conducting research to meet our 10-year sustainability goals. We also do research in biodegradation, microplastics, microfibers, we're gonna get into that, it's a very exciting area as well as sustainability assessment, measuring the sustainability and greenhouse gas emissions on the farm and from maybe making shirts and, and disposing of them. We also engage quite heavily with the NGO and sustainability community. We have to have a good reputation, a good standing uh, to make sure that when tools are created that measure your sustainability, well, we need to make sure they're accurate and <laughs> if at all possible, you know, looking at cotton in a very positive way as well as we gotta to continue to tell the story, not only to consumers, but to the supply chain who makes decisions about what they're putting in clothing that they put on the shelves. So we work within all these different areas to improve cotton sustainability reputation. So we're gonna get into sustainability communication first. Just kind of some base information here. Uh, we look at the Generation Z with some research from Cotton Incorporated and it shows that climate change, pollution and too much waste are you know, three really key concerns uh, of this up and coming buying class of individuals. So as we look to the future, these types of sustainability issues are here to stay and only increasing as extreme weather and these concerns move further to the top. So the, the buyer definitely is interested in sustainability. There's also been an immense amount of misinformation. I'm sure most of you have heard this before, cotton's a thirsty crop, or you know, there's a lot of really outdated, false, incorrect, whatever you want to call it, uh, information out there on the internet that is just frankly not correct. And there's been a, a upswell of really coming to reality with the terms of sustainability around the apparel industry and cotton. And recently there's a, a study called a cotton, a case study in misinformation that looked at how did cotton come to the point where there's so much misinformation around it. Uh, it really dives into the how and also debunks the common misperceptions. And this report, this, this report was really important. Um, we contributed heavily to that. It was done by the Transformers Foundation. I was an editor, but this kind of translated a lot of science into a very readable and approachable document that got picked up in Forbes. So that's a really high impact, a really you know, broad reach where this uh, writer here you know, went and said, cotton is not a thirsty crop. And that really helps move the needle in terms of you know, improving the perception of cotton. So I think the world is really looking for credible information now, and they're tired of just rumors and, 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 and information that's plainly false or incorrect or outdated. We have been working at Cotton Incorporated quite, you know, we have a history of communicating sustainability. Cotton Leeds was one of our first efforts at really improving the reputation of US and Australia cotton. 
where we, we, you know, it's really a megaphone that talks about all the great things that U.S. and Australian cotton growers are doing, all the innovation, precision ag, and sustainability innovation, as well as the 10-year sustainability goals and improvements through time. It certainly helped get the communication going and fill the, the void for a while that was there with good information around cotton. So we, that's been an integral program within communicating cotton sustainability. We also work within Cotton Works, another platform that's targeted primarily at speaking towards the supply chain. And it's not just sustainability, there's other things such as textile type uh, manufacturing webinars, but we do, I think last year, I think it did six or so webinars discussing sustainability. It kind of wore me out, but it was a great venue to bring on experts and to really dive into the 10 year sustainability goals or or webinars such as this one right here, Stopping the Plastic Leaks, talking about the benefits of cotton in terms of biodegradability. We also have a website totally dedicated to sustainability, and that's Cotton Today. We recently did a refresh on that to make it much more aesthetic appealing, as well as uh, better organize and refresh the content and improve the content to the target audience, which is the sustainability concerned and not so much the consumer, but somebody who's maybe working at an NGO or maybe in a supply chain or at a company, a sustainability individual who's wanting correct factual information. And this is all reviewed by the USDA. So you know, we cite everything very clearly. It takes a little while to get it all right, but it's important that it is right for that credibility. We cover all the major topics, water, um, herbicides, insecticides, biodiversity, carbon, greenhouse gas emissions. It really does a good job. I highly encourage you to check that out if you haven't yet. Also, just kind of as a handout, and I, I imagine um, some, of these, some of you on this call you know, may have heard or would like to have better information to combat rumors or misinformation when that occurs, when you, you know, are sitting there and you hear somebody say cotton is a thirsty crop. Well, we have fact sheets just for that purpose primarily. It's a you know, one front and, page, uh, front and back page document that really goes into the data, the details, and the, you know, the top things you might say to combat misinformation around, say, cotton is a thirsty crop. We have a water, a, a water fact sheet right here that can help with that, or conventional and organic cotton. So we produce these. It's just, a lot of times it's a great way to answer a question quickly, provide the, you know, the most potent information that you really want to go for. So those are all located on cotton today as well. And we always continue to explore other means of communicating, like podcasts. We did a podcast with Mind Body Green uh, on cotton's biodegradability and plastic pollution. We have within, I think, a month or so, we had up to 60 or 70,000 listens on that podcast. Quite a reach. And it's important that we you know, really not only go through traditional means of just a website, but really uh, you know, explore other routes to, to getting communication to the right audience around cotton. We also... Uh, you know, continue to produce blog posts around things such as soil health, as well as uh, publish research in scientific journals, which takes quite a long time, but really is the foundation for, you know, what we do, what we communicate. It all has to be cited back to science because we are a science-based organization. And that, that primary research is fundamental towards creating communications around all the other areas and through all the other pathways that we do communicate through. We also work with uh, Pheasants and Quail Forever. Chaz Holt is on this call. Uh, we're quite heavily with him um, to work with producers to identify areas of the farm that may not be producing at a profitable rate and look at how we can uh, create habitat in that area instead and improve habitat for birds, particularly the quail, as well as pollinators and other species. So here's a quick video that describes that. Uh, that project in Georgia. And this type of video is very helpful in communicating cotton sustainability story. You know, the connection to the land, the farmers are ultimate environmentalists. There's nothing finer than watching quail and, and hearing a bob white whistle. You know, and it used to be you could just walk out of your house and you could just hear it. Whenever you find a part of your, your land or part of the field that maybe isn't producing a, a profitable, you know, identify those areas, take them out of production, and create habitat for birds, bees, pollinators, etc. And meanwhile, focus on making the other parts of your land more profitable. The excitement really takes off, and Nick is someone who is showing that. He's incorporating all the latest precision technology to make the greatest decisions he can. And it's my job to leave the environment and the land 
better than when I got there for my children, for their children, for the next generation. So that program working with pheasants and quail forever has been a big success to really speak towards biodiversity and how do we improve that on the farm. And uh, that's a really short video and you can find that. Um, we'll send that out in the email after this, but there's actually a longer, about a nine minute video that really goes into the details and all the great things that Nick's doing on his farm. So that, that type of program and communication really hits and does, I think really improve cotton sustainability reputation as well as profitability on your farm. So getting into microplastics and microfiber and the de degradation for cotton, that's a big topic as of recently. So you may know that when you wash and dry your clothing and maybe even wear it too, little pieces of fiber come off your clothing and that gets into the air, it gets into the water, it gets into our food, it's pretty much everywhere. So every time you wash and dry your clothing, thousands of little pieces of fiber are actually coming off that clothing and getting into the waterway. And that's a problem. A recent study found that you actually eat about five grams of plastic every week. And that's equivalent of a credit card of plastic, which that doesn't sit well with my stomach. I don't know about you. So that's quite a lot of plastic. And this world is really waking up to the overall effects of plastic pollution and starting to measure that, starting to really bring a lot of science and research to better quantify these impacts. Consumers are also really picking up on this. And they find that um, we did a survey and found that microplastics are certainly on the minds of consumers. 19% and 27% found that uh, of consumers in China and the United States are aware of microplastic pollution and 60% say that'll affect their purchasing decisions. And that's up 59% from previous data points we have. We've worked quite heavily and closely with North Carolina State to better understand how cotton biodegrades, and it does. Cotton is a plant, we know that. And when you look at your field, the leftover cotton, it's not there the next year, it biodegrades. So we looked at how cotton biodegrades in lake water at the top right here, seawater, as well as a wastewater treatment plant. And in all scenarios, cotton biodegrades quite quickly. In polyester, well, it's a plastic, it doesn't really biodegrade. It persists in the environment nearly indefinitely and can get into our, our, our waterways, into our food, into our bodies. We have been working since around 2010 to really quantify and create that scientific basis for making claims around cotton. We first started with biodegradability, then looked at the shedding of fibers off our clothing. And we expanded that to how these uh, fibers for cotton biodegrade with different chemistries. We also look at soil and the landfill. And even in 2021, we looked at how they affect aquatic uh, life. So we're building a scientific basis to make credible claims around the benefits of cotton in terms of biodegradability and the overarching issues around polyester and the environmental harm it's causing. A recent study, uh, March 20 to 26 time period, uh, released on the 24th, actually found microplastics in our blood. And that's very concerning to me. And it seemed to be very concerning to the rest of the world. I know it got picked up on a lot of news outlets, but if you look at the uh, microplastics uh, in blood, um, red line here, nobody ever really searched this on Google, which is what we're looking at, until uh, that date. And that was a big peak. And that also corresponded with the peak of the most amount of searches for microplastics ever on the internet. So, you know, we have a good, you know, some of an upper trend through time. I think some COVID and other things kind of distracted the world. But the microplastics issue is rising, and these types of studies that really connect the issue to our bodies, I think, is really where the future of really communicating around this and showing the benefits of cotton, and maybe even clawing back some market share, or at least holding on to cotton market shares as we look to the future, because of sustainability. It's really a competitive advantage at this point for cotton. Another really important kind of area that, you know, another issue that has come to the forefront over the past few years is circularity, or it's kind of like recycling, but a little more of a broad definition. And we've been working in this space for quite a while with programs such as Blue Jeans Grow Green, where consumers can mail in their jeans to get them uh, re, uh, reused in terms of an insulation product that we often give towards groups such as Habitat for Humanity, as well as we take that and you can create insulation for other products. 
We're also really, uh, the definition of sustainability, as well as in this case, circularity, is being set by groups such as ISO, uh, the standard organization. And we're engaging with them. Michelle Wallace is a co-chair co of a committee that's actually creating a circular economy definition that will be used to judge products like cotton t-shirts. So it's important that we're there at the table, creating the metric, the yardsticks, and definitions that do judge our, our products and our, our services and, and what we create. We're also looking at how we can take old cotton and turn the cellulose, which is actually sugar, but the cotton fiber into sugar, which then can be used for other products as a chemical intermediate to make different plastics, different materials, even biofuels if you like to. We're also looking at composting the old, old clothing and seeing if you could you know, return it back to the soil. It came from the soil. It certainly can go back to the soil as we've all shown in previous research, as well as looking at, could we use that energy, uh, the energy embodied into the cotton fiber for bioenergy to make a green source of energy for you know, our homes? As well as we always got to communicate that and at Cotton Works, you can see we have a really nice diagram here where you talk about reuse, recycle, and return, and really communicating the different intricacies of cotton and how it is circular. So we definitely are researching this in terms of improving circularity for cotton, but we're also communicating that to supply chain and to consumers. Uh, one just hitting on the compostability is kind of a new thing front and center for us. We're launching a project with Cornell as we speak, looking at can we take jeans like these, which are, you know, kind of funny looking, uh, and compost them? What happens if you just toss a pair of jeans in a compost pile? Could we get some documentation to show this? You know, it's very compelling when you see, uh, you know, visual image of compostability in the soil. We're also going to do some studies to understand, you know, is there anything left over in the soil or in, or in the lab? Can you, know, what, you know, does it really matter that there's indigo on that? We're looking at all of this. And that is to help brands better understand what is the opportunity for labeling on their garments, this is compostable. A sustainability attribute labeled on a garment is a very challenging thing to do for a brand, mainly due to the traceability and just a, the global supply chain. It's hard to understand where that product came from. So if you can label a sustainability attribute that's inherent to the product being cotton, that's a big advantage for the brand to be able to speak at that level. And we're helping um, them do that. And we're looking at the different uh, green guides and FTC green guides to better understand what the limitations are now. And as they get revised, hopefully have some other provisions to speak about compostability as a sustainability attribute that's largely unique to cotton. So I think that this is gonna be an area that really solves the waste issue, circularity, you can even put carbon in the ground and return cotton back to its, you know, where it all started. So we also measure sustainability. The old adage that you can't manage at anything you don't measure. Well, we do a lot of measurement here. Um, how I actually got engaged with Cotton Incorporated originally as a consultant was I was helping Cotton Incorporated measure sustainability through a, a framework called life cycle assessment. And what that is, is measuring all the inputs such as water, fertilizer, uh, energy into producing the raw material, cotton, in terms of knitting and dry, uh, dyeing, all those different things in the manufacturing, also consumer use and disposal, measuring all the energy it took to do all those steps, and then all the emissions associated with that, such as CO2, waste, and co-products, and essentially environmental accounting and understanding where we are and what levers we have to improve. And here is just uh, one chart that I'll show you on the impacts of, of a cotton product here. I think it's a t-shirt. So if you look at um, global warming energy and water quality and water consumption, zooming in on global warming, the actual green bar there, the seed to bale or producing cotton, doesn't create that much impact. It's actually you know, really small as compared to the textile manufacturing and use and disposal. That is really where the majority of the global warming potential impacts come from. Uh, with energy, it's primarily the same, but cotton production on water quality and water consumption, well, yeah, it does contribute more from the agriculture phase in those arenas. But it's important to remember that you know, cotton is a relatively low carbon input to textile manufacturing, and the manufacturing really is where the majority of the impacts occur, along with uh, washing and drying your clothing. We also use this type of information to make a, a, a competitive advantage for cotton and cotton products, such as cottonseed oil. We, you know, constantly hear that we need to, you know, improve the markets for cottonseed oil and, and you know, they really make that more of a driver and, and cottonseed at large. So we're looking at this through a sustainability lens. And we've shown uh, that 
cottonseed oil right here is, you know, as compared to palm, soybean, and canola, um, creates much lower climate change impacts. And that's, you know, a huge competitive advantage over these other frying oils. And if you look at, say, food service companies or, or say, McDonald's that uses a, you know, quite a lot of frying oil, and they also have science-based targets or goals to reduce, reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Well, if they can switch to uh, at least a blend or, or over to cottonseed oil, they can significantly reduce their greenhouse gas emissions associated with their food products. So this is a competitive advantage that I think we can take forth and market to not only food, but potentially to other product uh, creators that use types of oils, surfactants and type things as a sustainable alternative to palm and other oil types. All right, getting into the on-farm sustainability trust protocol and the goals. So if you look at, I've mentioned climate change impacts and greenhouse gas emissions several times. Putting this into perspective, the apparel industry releases between two and 6.7% of the overall, overall global CO2 emissions. So it's not the major driver, but it certainly is to some extent significant. Uh, that being said, Cotton growers in the United States have gotten a lot better over the years, uh, you know, up to 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions over, over 35 years, as well as improvements in land use, soil loss, water, and energy. So again, you, you've made a lot of improvements that precision ag, different technologies, and improvements and, and yield have really driven this improvement through time. But brands are looking towards the future and creating science-based targets. Uh, there's more and more companies every time creating goals to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions in line with a 1.5 degree temperatureized future, meaning what they would have to reduce their emissions as a company to keep the world at the 1.5 temperature rise. And the US cotton industry has also created goals because brands are looking towards material, looking for materials that are creating improvements through time, such as cotton. And they want to know that the industry is making proactive steps towards improvement. And these goals surround improving soil carbon, improving yield or land efficiency. Meanwhile, decreasing the amount of soil loss per acre, decreasing the energy use, as well as greenhouse gas emissions and water. So we really are focused at how we can continue to improve our impact through time and help the brands use cotton as a sustainable material and help the consumers view cotton as a sustainable material and help them move away from materials like polyester that pollute their bodies with microplastics. So if you look at the trend through time, you can definitely see we're on that path. That 39% reduction is a bit aggressive, and we hope that we continue to yield and nitrogen use efficiency gains, capture more carbon from cover crops and no-till, and maybe carbon markets might help, and we'll get more into that here in a minute. So fertilizer plays a big role in our overall greenhouse gas emissions of cotton production, about 60%. And I know, as mentioned on this call, you're probably feeling that fertilizer price as well as other inputs, it's very high. Uh, so really right now has never you know, been a better time to really re-examine, can we improve nitrogen use efficiency for a profitability perspective, but also for a sustainability? We can reduce our fertile, improve, let's say improve our fertilizer use efficiency. We can reduce the amount of impacts we create per pound of cotton. And that's very important as well as reducing that cost. So ecosystem service markets or carbon markets, carbon inset markets, it's called a lot of things, but the broad term is ecosystem service. You've probably heard about uh, getting paid to maybe put cover crops in or getting paid for carbon, putting in the ground. Well, that's what we're gonna talk about here. So just as a high level perspective here, I think this is a, an opportunity. Growers are getting paid to do this. I think you know, there is some money to be made. However, there are certainly some risks and there's a really you know, a wild west type of feeling to this currently. But what this is, is essentially, if you have, say, an airline, you know, they're going to need to burn some sort of fuel to fly that airplane. They can't totally reduce that to zero, but they have emission reduction goals. So they might pay cotton growers to put carbon in the ground or to, you know, other entities to put solar panels or renewable energy or trees and to create that benefit. And that benefit would then be shared over to the um, airline or other company that cannot totally reduce their emissions. And typically we look at that amount of benefit as a ton of carbon insets or offsets. So a metric ton or 2000 pounds of CO2 equivalent. So you probably have some questions. I'm sure you and your friends do like, you know, how will I be paid? Uh, what about my data? That's uh, you know pretty sensitive. I don't want that to be used against me. And that's certainly a good concern. I, I 
hundred percent agree. How will these be regulated? What about a contract? Am I signing my farm away? You know, there's a, a lot of really solid questions and there's some barriers to entering this, such as if you've been doing this for years, can you still do it now and get paid? Uh, buying cover crop seed certainly isn't free. Uh, so, you know, how will you overcome those hurdles, particularly with rising input prices? So these are all valid concerns that we're looking towards answering as much as we can. This past year we engaged, oh. and we worked with, uh, this past year we, we worked with a cotton producer, two cotton producers in North Carolina to uh, really look at, you know, what it is to work with a ecosystem service market provider and create these insets. And we took that information, about 400 acres of paid per practice in North Carolina, and created uh, you know, additional resources to help guide producers, one of which is this document here you see on the right-hand side, what cotton, what cotton growers should ask and why when it comes to carbon. So this is really a document, a, a piece of material that helps you guide and, and navigate these really changing and wild west type of uh, markets out there. We've also done webinars uh, solely on that, actually, cotton and coffee, we had one, but also we have it over on cotton to cultivate it as well as the uh, plant health exchange. So we're really trying to provide guidance and leadership in this space because we think there is an opportunity to you know, have additional revenue to actually make that change on your farm. But we also realize that there is a lot of uncertainty risk associated with this. It's not a risk free endeavor. So we're hoping to, to really help guide that. And we'll send some of these documents out along with the follow up email to this webinar. Kind of getting towards the end here, um, not only are brands looking to improve their actual cotton impacts, but they're looking to source what they call 100% sustainable. And that largely means uh, the cotton that is coming from a sustainability program. They want another entity to kind of sign off on the sustainability of that material, largely to, to own some of that risk. They want to say, we sourced from a program and therefore the program should ensure that this is meeting some level of sustainability and worker protection rights and maybe even traceability. So, you know, if from a business perspective, they're trying to share some of that risk of sourcing with another entity, as well as, you know, stimulate more sustainable change on the farm as well. So a lot of brands, you know, a large portion of the industry is committed towards using sustainable sourced cotton. Uh, and that means, again, coming from a sustainability program. And there's multiple programs out there uh, but what we're going to talk about today is the U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol briefly here. And that is the U.S. Cotton Sustainability Program that is really the flagship within the industry, in my opinion. It brings a lot of data, a lot of credibility, and working with some of the most sustainable producers in the world here in the United States. You may have heard of this, but essentially it's a, it's a sustainability program that meets the needs of the brands when they're looking for that sustainably sourced cotton. The program entails enrolling your farm on a profile, it's pretty quick. You do a checklist of best practices, best management practices, things like do you use cover crops, do you follow the label, do you irrigate? It's a questionnaire, you know, you go through that pretty quickly, multiple choice, it's not too hard. Uh, there's also the field print calculator, which then you enter things such as your yield, where you, you map out a field on your farm. And it's a little more intensive, but it gives you, a again, a benchmark to look at uh, measuring your sustainability, how much greenhouse gas emissions are you creating per pound, how much, uh, what's your water use efficiency look like, and you can actually compare that to your region or, or other growers in the program, and that can actually provide you some useful information in benchmarking your production system as compared to your, to your neighbors. I know many of you are competitive, and you really do want to drive to doing the best you can, and this gives you information that might help you in terms of improving and dialing in your operations in a new way that Traditionally, it really hasn't been available. This tool is relatively new. And then there is an independent aspect of verification to make sure that you just answered the questions right. And you, know, you say you did cover crops, you know, that, that you actually did, things such as that. So it's really just making sure that that is truthfully answered. And this is all to meet the 10-year sustainability goals by looking at these uh, impacts and benchmarking yourself and considering new sustainability practices on the farm. This will help us meet our 10-year sustainability goals also help brands such as Gap and Levi's and Target meet their sustainability goals while increasing trust, lowering the brand risks and improving environmental outcomes as well as profitability in many cases. So finally, leadership and engagement. I mentioned earlier how we are heavily involved in groups such as ISO, but far beyond that, we work with groups such as the Textile Exchange, which is really focused on improving 
the sustainability attributes of fibers going into our clothing. And it's really important that we engage with those communities to make sure that uh, they have a big platform to make sure that they're representing cotton fairly, to make sure that they're using the most up-to-date information because they have significant influence. Those NGOs and those organizations have a big platform to communicate to the brands. That's a really, I think there's, you know, every conference that we go to, the textile exchange, sometimes 800 brand representatives, big brands too. We also work with Field to Market on the metrics committee there, making the metrics that we actually measure sustainability in a way that works for cotton growers. We're also engaged with Better Cotton, again, ISO, the Sustainability Consortium. And finally, the Sustainable Apparel Coalition is another really important one. And that is an organization that makes tools that measure cotton sustainability. And we're working with them right now, the, the, the cotton expert group, to make better tools to measure cotton sustainability because, frankly, it hasn't been all that good in the past. And they're working with us and the rest of the industry to improve that. And I also like to recognize U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol and the broader industry coming together to engage these entities in a, in a way that really wasn't done in the past to really show up to the table and provide leadership around cotton so that others don't, that don't have the information we have. We're really lending our expertise and really improving the outcomes in terms of sustainability reputation for cotton. So I ran through a lot there, but you know, some really exciting things for cotton sustainability. We're really making changes on the farm, through the supply chain, and really influencing both brands as well as consumers in terms of their perception of sustainability and how you grow cotton on your farm. So uh, I think uh, we'll probably have some questions, and this is always a hot topic, but uh, we'll, I guess we'll pivot to that, and I thank you for your attention. Thanks. Thank you, Jesse. That was 